the first thing uh, that you've got to that you've got to ask yourself as you as you're thinking about what the legal considerations are, is you're talking about equity or you're talking about non-equity crowdfunding, because from the legal perspective they are entirely different, uh, very different analysis, very different way to look at them, very different sets of concerns, uh, and I think that you know we've already talked about I think Tom went through in a lot of detail and talked about what some of the issues are and things you need to think about in the world of non-equity, um, and some discussion on the equity side too, and we'll. We'll, we'll go into uh, more of that, to more of that in a little bit more detail. Um, really, it should, it, as I think about it, it really shouldn't say equity versus non-equity. Equity, I think, leads people to think about just stock. It really should be security selling versus non-security selling. And I think if you look at it that way, maybe it'll give you a little bit of a broader perspective. Uh, because uh, securities is more than just equity. Securities is more than stock. As I pointed out in my quick comment before, it can also include the sale of a promissory note. Um, you know, so you've got to be really careful when you're out there trying to raise money for your venture. And if you're selling something to somebody other than a product, you're, you're giving them an interest in your business. Even if it's not stock, it could be a security. And if it is a security, then you've got to look at it through the securities lens, you know, through the new Jobs Act lens, not through the Kickstarter lens, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, the other thing you got to think about in connection with all of this is the um, the current environment. I mean, Kickstarter's been around for ages compared to uh, equity uh, crowdfunding, right? Which is just became uh, potentially legal uh, in April of this year. I mean, Kickstarter's been around for a little while. I don't know, a couple of years anyway. I don't know when your first uh, venture was. Uh, mine was about uh, almost two years ago. Okay, yeah. Kickstarter's been around. Close to four, I think. Yeah. Been that long, so been been around for, for, for a while compared to equity uh, compared to equity uh, crowdfunding, but it also lives in a world where because you're not selling securities, as I pointed out, it's a different set of rules that you have to worry about, and I think easier to fit in the current uh, legal environment. You know, you're not selling a piece of your business. There are things things that you need to think about and worry about uh, that I'll talk about shortly. When you talk about equity crowdfunding, it is very, very new. I think it was signed into law on April 5th of this year, sometime around then, not, not April 1st. It wasn't April Fool's Day, it was a couple days later. Um, but it, it, it's historically not been allowed, I think, as both of these guys, the previous speakers have both pointed out. I mean, crowdfunding, raising money from a lot of unaccredited investors, historically hasn't been allowed. Um, so it is, it is very new. It's a whole new environment, a whole new set of rules, most of which we don't even know yet. So, um, thanks. So let's just talk about considerations from my perspective. I'll say the legal perspective. I guess say the legal business perspective for some of the non-equity crowdfunding uh, stuff. Um, it is more project-based than business-based. You can use it to build a business. You can use it to test a project. You can do those things. But typically when people are looking to raise money and you're attracting an investor, an investor in the pure kind of finance sense is really interested in, in building a business long term and maybe less interested uh, historically in, in project stuff. So if you're looking to fund a project, Kickstarter could be a great way to do that. If you're looking to get a business off the ground you know, very quickly, um, the money that you can raise from Kickstarter, at least historically, it's just going to make that difficult. You're going to have to take more time to do it. You're going to have to do it in stages. So as you're thinking about which aspect of crowdfunding, equity, non-equity, you might want to think about for your project, for your business, for whatever it is, you know, think about the process, the timing. Uh, if you're trying to capture market share quickly, if you've got a lot of other competitors, um, you've got to think about whether non-equity crowdfunding is going to get you to where you need to be when you need to get there. Related to that is the limited capital raising. Um, you know, if you look at Kickstarter, I just looked at it now again to, con to, to take another look at it. According to the Kickstarter stats, seven out of the 26,887 projects that have been funded by Kickstarter as of about 20 minutes ago raised a million dollars or more. So seven out of 27,000. I can't even do that math in my head. I don't know what percentage that is, but it's really small. Uh, 206 out of the 26,887 raised 100,000 or more. So if you do the rough math, uh, it's about 24,000 of the 27,000 projects um, are under $100,000. Uh, 
So that just gives you a sense of the scale of the kind of projects and, and amount of money that you can expect to raise through some of these portals. It's just a different kind of, different kind of animal. Um, there's other things you need to think about on the crowdfunding side as an investor anyway, if you put your investor hat on, not, not your project hat on, but your investor hat, if you're looking at these deals. There's actually, to, to, to the surprise of many, I think, very few instances uh, that I've been able to find about fraud on Kickstarter and the other portals, which I think is great, but it's at least a concern. I know there was a, um, a video game um, scam that went around a year or two ago. Uh, but what was amazing about that, what I think is one of the benefits of crowdfunding, is it was basically uncovered, the, the fraudulent nature of the project was uncovered by the crowd. You know, people said, hey, wait a minute, I recognize those graphics, you know, those from my other website, I've seen that somewhere else. And they pieced it together, and the crowd shut down the, uh, the opportunity before they had met their dollar threshold. So money didn't change hands. But when you're talking about crowds of people, there's at least, theoretically, a greater risk of, of fraud. And as an investor, you just need to be aware of that. And you have to do some level of diligence and homework to make sure you're comfortable with that. Um, other issues, and these are issues that, as I was thinking about non-equity crowdfunding, I would worry about if I was talking to a client, either on the investor side or the project side. Um, one is warranty issues as you sell your headphones and other things. You know, if they don't work right, if they don't work, uh, I know you were going to talk about what if you don't provide any product. Um, Related to all of that, you know, you have potential warranty claims and people not happy with the product or the reward that they've gotten. And if you've set up your campaign in, through Kickstarter as a personal thing, hey, send me money so I can get my earphones made or I can get my project going, there's potential personal liability there if there's ever a claim down the road. When you're selling equity, there's always that potential as well, which we don't need to talk about now, but it's a company that's selling its security. So there's, you, you need to keep that in mind. You're putting yourself out there oftentimes on the non-equity side when you're raising money for your, for your project. Um, you could have customer relations issues, you know, deposit issues. Uh, you take money, you, you can't provide the product. I would worry about consumer protection issues coming up or at least regulators in the states being worried about consumer protection issues, people giving deposits for things and never getting the product that they were promised. Where does that leave the project leader? Where does that leave the person who set up the campaign on, on uh, Kickstarter or whatever? So, you know, there are some things that you need to worry about uh, when you're either looking at these projects or I think more importantly looking to set up these projects and saying, hey, how can I raise money for, uh, for, my, for my venture, for my project? Um, next slide. Um, considerations for the, uh, for the equity crowdfunding. What I'll tell you now, and this is part of my downer presentation, part of my scared straight uh, discussion. Uh, don't do it. At least don't do it yet. Um, the act was passed in April, on April 5th, uh, or was signed into law on April 5th, I believe. But uh, there is so much in that law that is left to the SEC to make up rules. There's actually a paragraph on the SEC's website that says, hey people, the act has passed. We haven't come up with rules yet. Keep in mind that until we come up with rules, you better not do anything, right? So they, they've kind of shot that, you know, shot that uh, cannonball across your bow, and you've got to be careful. Um, I think, as somebody pointed out, the um, the rules are supposed to be the rules for part of the um, crowdfunding stuff was supposed to be done by July. They haven't been done yet. There's a meeting coming up to talk about uh, what those rules might look like at the end of August. Uh, but there won't be rules announced in August, that's my guess. And the crowdfunding rules are supposed to be um, done by the end of the year. And in a perfect world they would be, my guess is they're not even going to be close. I know there's a set of rules that the SEC is working on for what they call bad boy provisions related to security sales that were supposed to be done last July. And those aren't done yet, and as they're distracted by trying to get those done, it may slow down some of the rulemaking for some of these, uh, for some of the crowdfunding rules that have just, uh, just been passed. So I would love it if they were able to get their act together, get the rules out by the end of the year. Um, I'll also be very surprised. But surprise can be a good thing. Um, the, other, uh, the other thing that I'll just point out um, is you've also got to be wary of state regulators. So historically, oftentimes, what's happened on the equity side is the feds kind of pay attention to the bigger deals, and then the states pay attention to the smaller deals. So the crowdfunding law was set up where the federal government will be able to preempt state law in a lot of ways with respect to crowdfunding, 
but that doesn't mean that the state regulators um, won't also try to do what they think they need to do to tamp down you know the potential for fraud um, so I don't want to of course they're doing their job doing a great job uh, but they run the risk that there are going to be rules by the state regulators that we don't even know about yet haven't anticipated and you've got to be careful about that too there's going to be two sets of rules you've got to abide by so I should probably take just a little bit of a step back just to tell you a couple of basic things about securities and equity when you want to sell securities what do you need to do in a very general way you need to either have your securities registered you know go through kind of the IPO registration process which you never want to do until you're going to go really big or you want to find an exemption you want to find a way that you can sell your securities without having to go through that whole registration process and that's where the crowdfunding equity crowdfunding stuff plays so if you don't want to have to go through all of the registration, follow all the registration rules, you've got to find an exemption. There are some exemptions that apply now to, for people who are wealthier or for very small numbers of small investors, 10 or fewer, for example, in New Hampshire. Uh, but um, when you do want to go down the road of trying to raise capital by selling securities, that's at least the general framework you've got to think about. Um, you know, I'm not going to register it. What's the exemption? What's the federal exemption? Does crowdfunding apply? Does it not apply? And if it doesn't apply, is there another exemption I can use? Uh, and then states, you know, what are the state exemptions uh, that I may need to rely on? Uh, next slide, thanks. Um, so when you're thinking about equity crowdfunding, one of the things they did build into the statute is a lot of different rules. And we've talked about some of them. Um, the problem with rules in a general way is that it just becomes more expensive to comply. So if you want to raise money using equity crowdfunding, um, the more rules there are, the more complicated it is to do it the right way, the more complicated it is to, the right, to do it the right way, the more expensive it can be to comply. Now, I say that, but when you have portals like WeFunder, I think one possible way where it could work are through portals that are set up like WeFunder, um, where they have very well thought out systems in place that can systemize a lot of the rule following procedures that you've got to worry about. I think time will tell um, how all that plays out because we don't even know what all the rules are yet. But I think that you know the portals and what they're doing at WeFunder is at least one way where hopefully this will play out and be something that, uh, that entrepreneurs will be able to really utilize. But let's talk about some of the, the issues to consider. Uh, what are the financial disclosure requirements? Just to give you some sense of the rules that you'll need to follow and in my view um, how ridiculous some of the rules are that you need to follow if you want to try to raise money through, through crowdfunding. Uh, one is if you have a uh, company with, with uh, or you're trying to raise between zero and say $100,000 you need to provide you know as an information disclosure uh, your latest tax return assuming you even have a tax return. I'm not sure what you do if you don't have a tax return but if you have a tax return you need to provide that as a financial disclosure piece of information trying to raise between $100,000 and $500,000, that's not enough. You need to also provide um, a set of financials that have been reviewed by a CPA. So one, you've got the, now you've got, okay, what rule do I need to follow? Okay, I've got to figure out, make sure I'm following the rule. Now you've got to pay a CPA to make sure you have reviewed financials. So it's another cost associated with raising money through, through the crowdfunding uh, procedures. If you're trying to raise $5,000,000 5, 500, to a million, that's not good enough. You actually have to provide audited financial statements uh, as an informational disclosure, which I think for most startup companies is kind of ridiculous. I mean, you don't even have any financial historical performance to audit, but you've got you've to come up with something according to the statute, the way it's laid out, and spend what could potentially be a lot of money just to get audited financials so that you're set up the right way to be able to raise the amount of money you think you need for your venture. Um, another we've talked about a little bit is the, the, um, the uh, investment amount limits. How much can people invest? And there's some rules there you, you have to follow. And we've already gone through those, but it's just based on how much you either have in assets or how much you earn. And you've got to be aware of, of what those limits are. Uh, and if you're an investor, keep track of that, presumably. And if you're a company looking to raise money, make sure that the people aren't investing too much in your company. Because if they are, you run the risk as the company taking in the money that you violated the crowdfunding uh, rules. So the question is, how do you verify whether I, as an investor, have invested my $2,000 already in another venture? 
I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know what the companies are going to have to do to make sure that their investors are following the crowdfunding rules and not over investing in these startups. It's a question to be determined. Hopefully, um, limitations on the round size. You can only raise up to a million dollars. I mean, that's all part of the crowdfunding uh, picture, right? They don't. They don't want this to be used to raise millions and millions of dollars. You can raise a million dollars a year. Um, there are a couple of catches, though. If you raise $900,000 through a crowdfunding deal, and then you say, you know what, I've raised my crowdfund, now I'm going to go out just to accredited investors, and I want to raise $5 million. You've got to wait. You've got to make sure that under the, the crowdfunding rules, you can only raise a $1 million within a 12-month period. So if you raise nine hundred, and then you want to raise more than another 100000 or you want to go outside the crowdfunding act, you've got to wait because whatever money you raise is going to go count against the million that you're allowed to raise in that one year period, and it's going to screw up your crowdfunding <coughs> financing. So you, you're going to have to be planning ahead to say, I want to raise no more than a million in the next year. Okay, crowdfunding may work. If you want to raise more than a million in the next year, even if you think crowdfunding might work for part of it, it may not work because down the road, the money that you raise is going to come back and spoil the crowdfunding exemption that you had. So you've got to look at the whole the whole scenario. Um, there are restrictions on the sale method, you know, through a portal, a broker, and I talked about that a little bit. I think that actually is not a, you know, may, may actually be a good thing because they'll be able to set up the systems to help with some of the rule compliance. And just the costs, um, you know, I think one of the attractions of, of Kickstarter and project-based financing like that is you can do it without, a, without much of a money outlay. But the, the web portals are going to be looking for a fee, presumably, because they've got to keep their lights on. You might have to provide uh, audited financials, so you'll be paying a CPA. You're going to be stuck paying a lawyer to do something, even if it's just to cut stock certificates to people. Uh, so sorry, but we're going to be part of the process along the way somewhere, maybe less. But you, you know, there is going to be an accumulation of costs, and some of those costs you have to lay out, potentially, before you raise the money. You've got to get your audited financial stuff, things like that. So. There is going to be at least that consideration you'll have to keep in mind. And another I wrote down uh, that, that's not here is with crowdfunding as a business owner, um, you know, if, if one of the things people are looking for is involvement in your business, be careful, right? Because uh, it could be a great thing when you get a lot of different opinions, and it can be a horrible thing <laughs> when you get a lot of different opinions. You can have a situation where there are too many cooks in the kitchen. You spend all of your time answering questions and fielding calls and things like this from the guy who put in, you know, $150 into your company. So you've got to be, at least think through the distractions, right, and what that what that could mean for your business. Um, uh, next slide. So th this slide is is in small font. Don't, don't try to read it. This is just trying to make a point that there are a lot of rules you need to follow uh, when you want to follow through and, and uh, think about doing a, an equity crowdfunding piece. There's information requirements that the company has to meet. Uh, there are disclosure requirements and information requirements that the portal has to meet. Um, and there are other disclosure requirements about you know, uh, whether or not there are people who have a criminal past or involved. And there's a whole bunch of things that we don't even know what they're going to be yet because the SEC hasn't come out with their rules. So this list is presumably going to grow. You know, maybe the portals can help you know, meander through that list and make it more manageable. But there's, because there are so many rules you have to follow, there's going to be some cost just to make sure that you are doing things the right way. The, the only thing worse than, than um, you know, following the rules and spending the money to follow the rules is not following the rules and then having to pay even more money to fix whatever problem was created. And when you're in the world of securities because of the regulatory environment, fixing problems uh, can, be, can be expensive. Um, so next slide. There's another piece, just a small piece, I just want to mention quickly to the whole crowdfunding thing. Right now, if you want to raise money, you generally can't, you generally can't generally solicit from people. You can't put an ad in a newspaper, the Wall Street Journal, and say, hey, I'm trying to raise money. There is a movement afoot to say, and part of the Jobs Act that says, you can generally solicit to raise funds, but you can only sell to accredited investors, those wealthy individuals that have more than a million dollars of net assets or make more than a couple hundred grand a year, or 300 grand a year together with their spouse. Um, so if they meet those requirements, you can, you, you can generally solicit, you can only sell to those accredited investors, 
That could be a very valuable thing, though, to companies looking to raise money because they can get the word out more broadly. Uh, but we don't know what strings are going to are going to be attached to, to this provision either. Um, there's going there's a big meeting on August 22nd um, coming up that maybe Mike knows about, um, and there's going to be discussion about these general solicitation rules. These rules again were supposed to be done in July. They're not done yet, but they'll talk about them in August. So just to give you a sense of the timing of some of this stuff, it's going to take a while. Um, okay, uh, next slide. So here, here are my takeaways. Um, Non-equity crowdfunding, I mean, you've heard it can be a great thing. Successfully um, get projects off the ground, test ideas, uh, maybe be the, the beginnings of a great business. But if you do it, just know what you're getting into. And I think that that's been, been covered already, but there are ups and downs of, of non-equity uh, crowdfunding. Um, that if you're aware of it, at, at least you go into it with your eyes wide open. With equity crowdfunding, don't even think about it. Just don't do it. Uh, the act has been passed. The rules have not. The rules are going to be incredibly important so that we all know what you need to do to actually comply with the requirements for doing an equity crowdfunding. I hope that um, after those rules start to come out and the discussion continues that I can be as enthusiastic about crowdfunding as the other guys we've heard talk this morning. I'm a little bit uh, pessimistic just because, you know, as you can see on my, one of my prior slides, the list of rules, even in the statute, is already uh, somewhat onerous. Some might say very onerous. Some might say a little ridiculous. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. And uh, happy to kind of answer questions and talk it through for anybody else who uh, wants to. Yeah. Just um, from the investor point of view, yeah. one thing I haven't heard anything about is um, how a small investor gets their money out of their investment. Most of us are investing for specific purposes, retirement, funding our children's college education, that sort of thing. I can invest in a stock today and sell it tomorrow. Has there been any thought about that part of it? I, I think it's a great question because what it does is it underscores a reason why equity crowdfunding is so much different than non-equity. With non-equity, you know what you're getting and you have a, a sense of timing. With equity crowdfunding, you are stuck. It's, there's no public market, right? So once you buy it, what the, part of the deal is you've got to be willing to hold it. And hopefully there's an exit. It could be two years, could be five years, could be seven years, could be never. Um, so you don't have that same level of control generally when you buy into a private company. And it's those kinds of um, nuances that I think make crowdfunding with equity a little bit of a challenge because people, at least people need to understand what they're buying when they get into it. Uh, and I don't think people necessarily do. It sounds like it's great. It could be a great thing. Um, but you also don't want to steer people away from or towards something that may just not be appropriate. Do you think that might be part of a savvy equity um, equity crowdfunding what, offering? Uh, what, the, what the SEC may require is may require investors to sign a statement that will have a whole bunch of things. I, underst I fully understand and appreciate that I'm investing in a private company and I may not ever be able to sell my shares. Right? So at least it'll call it out to you if you actually read all the documentation. Yeah. Uh, that you, so you know, you'll have an opportunity to have that disclosure made, think about it, and then really decide whether or not it's an appropriate investment for you. Do we have time for questions, Tom? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised not to hear anybody talk about IP and IP protection, it was touched on, but how much do you worry about, you know, the iron buds is somebody, you know, scamming that idea and, and running with it, or is that just sort of, being nervous over nothing? I think it's an incredibly important due diligence uh, question. And one of the things that, that, that we don't know yet is when you're doing a crowdfunding equity deal, what level of due diligence is anybody doing? For example, let's take the earbuds, and, and maybe, it's a, maybe it's an issue with Kickstarter too, but with the earbuds, let's say that he had stolen the idea from me. Uh, you don't, nobody's doing the diligence on that to check to see if there's any kind of claim or infringement or overlap or anything. So there is a, a kind of a dearth of information uh, because of the minimized uh, due diligence that will be done on these deals. Well, conversely, I guess the question is, is there protection if somebody yanks it, you know, I want to go try and raise 60000 bucks? Is there protection for me as an issuer worried about somebody yanking the idea in any way or no? Um, yeah, I, would, I mean, I would think so. I mean, I think whenever you go out there and you start talking to investors or talking to the market or trying to raise capital, you have to take steps to protect what it is you're selling. And maybe that is, I'm not sure if that's your question, but if you've got earbuds and you want to talk to investors about it and you don't want somebody stealing the idea, you don't want the market hearing about it and having somebody else run with it, then you've got to figure out what IP protections you should have 
so that when you talk to the market and people learn about it, you've still got something that's protected enough that has value that people will invest in. So you gotta go patented, basically? Uh, it depends on what it is. Patent, a trade secret is incredibly powerful. I've had clients who were just about to go to the patent office and file a patent on some process they had, and um, they had a buyer come up and say, don't patent it, because if you patent it, it becomes public. We wanna buy it as a trade secret, because it was a formulation, and nobody would be able, it's like the Coke secret formula. We don't want that to be public. We want that to be ours. We're gonna keep it secret. So it depends on the nature of the IP, but you, and you've got to think about that. Depending on the nature of the IP, how do you best protect it?